bankruptcy, divorce laws, disability, probate, there are so many classes on the path to practicing law. Unfortunately, most schools fail to instruct you on the business of law. This is Solo De Facto, a show dedicated to discovering the success secrets that exist in the reality of running a solo practice. My goal is to find the one thing that separates each guest from the rest to give you practical solutions to create a thriving firm. Solo De Facto is sponsored by Back Office Betty's, trusted virtual legal receptionist. Welcome, everyone. We're here today with another great episode of Solo De Facto. I'm your host, Tom Dufton, and I'm really excited about today's guest. She's an industry thought leader. She's certified by the National Board of Trial Advocacy and Family Law. She's a business coach for solo law firm owners at Law Firm Mentor LLC. Please welcome to the show, Allison Williams. Allison, great to have you here. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited for this episode and to talk to your audience. I'm so glad to have you here, and we're just going to hit the ground running here, so I'm going to go right to the question I always love to ask, which is, what's one thing you wish attorneys knew about running a successful law firm? So the one thing that I would say that I I want everyone to take away from any type of discussion that I have about law firm ownership and growth is that everything requires a system. And I think most lawyers intellectually understand that. They understand that from the perspective of I have to systematize my statute of limitations so that I meet all the filing deadlines for my clients. And they understand the basics of I have to systematize getting people in the door. So I need to have intake systems dialed in and that sort of thing. But when I say systematize everything, I mean every problem that exists, every issue that needs to be resolved, everything that you do in the course of a law firm, law firm ecosystem requires a system even more than your average small business because the practice of law is so demanding. So if you take the demands of practicing law and then add it to the demands of running a business, it almost always will collapse the person under the stress and the overwhelm before they get to actually optimizing themselves, their business, their profit. It it just isn't a healthy way to exist. And I see so many lawyers run themselves down or even just give up their dream of owning a law firm because of that reality. No, a lot of it brings me back to that saying of everything's in its place and in its place is everything, right? Mm-hmm. So I feel like having a nice organized environment can make such a difference. I mean, so many people all the time, if you don't have it organized, you're going to drive yourself crazy going through files and drawers, wondering where everything is that you need. So how much of a difference can that really make on a day to day practice as well? Well, so one of the things that we talk about, ironically, it's so ironic we're having this conversation because today is the middle of uh, one of the signature programs we offer here, absolutely free of charge at Law Firm Mentor. It's called our Crushing Chaos Masterclass. And in the masterclass, we start by talking about the value of systems so that people understand it. And it's far more than just keeping your, uh, your mind clear and, and keeping your environment organized. It really goes to the heart of where I think a lot of people find dissatisfaction in life, but beyond that, dissatisfaction dissatisfaction in business, which is the lack of energy that you have at the end of a day when you are intellectually bouncing to and fro, um, you know, just trying to get through all the things. In fact, one of the things that I see a lot is when lawyers start to start to really build systems, they find that it reduces the stress, right? The stress is not the actual activity. It's the question mark around, is this going to cause me a problem? Is this going to get me the result that I want? That running ticker tape in your mind about whether or not you are wasting your energy, wasting your effort, making money, uh, causing more risk for you to have a grievance filed or a malpractice suit filed, all of that is what erodes your energy throughout the course of a day. So Lawyers will leave the office at five o'clock, but they then go home and they have no interest in engaging with their family. They have no time for their spouse, no time for their kids. They just want to crash and watch TV. And they often think that that's because they're lazy or because um, or or because the, the stress of the work. It often is not those things. It really is that you are wearing out your mind by focusing on things that really should not have any level of conscious awareness. They should really be on autopilot. So that the time and energy that you are dedicating to your business is really dedicated to the highest and best use of your talents, which is the practice of law and coming up with those strategies for your clients. Now, would outsourcing help with any of this as well? Or is that kind of not in the same realm there? 
Yeah, so outsourcing plays a very critical part in this because the outsourcing piece of it is, and we say this all the time, that if you want more time in a business, you have to have people and systems. Whether those people are people that you hire part-time, full-time in your business, or they are contractors, vendors outside of your business, ultimately you cannot do but so many things in the course of a day and you certainly can't become expert at all of them. So the more that you bring other people in to your business, whether that's into your business, again, full-time or part-time, or as a tributary to your business, the more success you're going to have at doing the things that matter to you. And frankly, if you are really trying to drive up profit, you are always going to be looking to have the most qualified, least expensive person in the business doing the work. So why would I, as a lawyer who can generate three, four, five hundred dollars an hour off of my labor, be giving my labor over to a task that I can pay someone 10, 15, 20 dollars an hour? Like intellectually, the math just does not make sense. Now, why is this so hard for so many people to wrap their heads around? Well, I think we all have our own uh, limiting beliefs about what's possible, right? So I think what, what, what is kind of the, the kind of the golden example of this, and I use myself as an example all the time because I know I have permission to do so, um, is you know, when, I, when I first started my law firm, I remember I had 43 clients when I started. You know, I had generated 50 clients or so at my law firm where I was, and I had said to some of them, stay behind, your case is almost over. For the rest, I said, you know, come with me. And they did. And so I walked in day one with a lot of clients, a lot of responsibilities. And my secretary, who had said she was coming with me, resigned <laughs> or said, never mind, I don't want to start up a whole law firm. I know what that journey is. I don't want to do that. So I'm immediately overwhelmed, right? And the way that I thought to be successful was to simply work harder, because that was what I had always done, right? If you if you can't get it done in eight hours, it becomes nine hours, then 10, then 12, then 15. And so I expanded doing more of the same thing. I, I never gave myself the opportunity to stop and think. If I had just taken those same 43 clients, right? And as I started to wind down some cases, more cases came in. But if I had said, what is a reasonable amount of money I'm making off of each of my clients? And what is the amount that I want to be making? And instead of saying, let me go out and get more clients and be working faster, harder all the time, if I had said, let me raise my price point by $50 and take one less client a month, I would have started to create more time and more money contemporaneously. And that's, those are the strategies that we teach, but those are not counterintuitive, right? We, it's almost like we kind of have this lack mindset that there's not enough. So if I don't immediately go pursue more clients, I won't have more clients available and that is what then stops us from saying, if I pull back, I'll do better. We think if I pull back, I'll lose what I already have and I'll start to go downhill. So it seems a lot of it can be attributed to uh, quanti- quality over quantity there. A lot of people think that they have to have the highest number. They have to have the most clients. They have to be at the top of the top there. But really, it seems like if they kind of take it back a little bit and scale and really think to themselves, what's a better way that I can take care of it mentally? and for my clients, that just makes our life a whole lot easier. If- yeah, so it's a quality and quantity issue, right? So if in the first instance, when you need to kind of get your bearings, right? Not every law firm owner is in the situation that I was in. Most law firm owners that I know that go out on their own, they typically have a dearth of clients. They don't have an excess of clients. But wherever you fall, if there's a moment where you need to get yourself strategically aligned to create the growth that you desire, the first thing I always recommend is getting the clear plan of what you want on paper, right? So that always starts with what exactly do I want, right? Do I want to create a mega firm or do I want to create a a three-person boutique? Do I want to uh, have many different practice areas and I'm going to start with two or three or do I just want to specialize in one thing and have that one thing be what I'm known for? You have to first figure out what you want and then create the plan. But Part of the challenge is that is, of that is that if you get too busy, you don't have time to stop and think and create the plan. You're almost in constant reaction mode. And you always have to get yourself out of reaction mode to make the best decision for yourself. So we always tell our lawyers here at Law Firm Mentor, focus on getting yourself to the highest margin of profit on the work that you have. Now, sometimes that means immediately go hire someone because you can immediately get someone through the door and they can be making you more money if the amount of money that you're making is not sufficient to meet your basic needs and the needs of growing a business. But for a lot of our clients, it is, take a moment, pause, let's re-engineer your pricing, let's get you to a better price point and don't turn away the business in this moment, but slow it down, right? Start to put people on a waiting list, right? 
The idea that every client is going to immediately go hire someone else is not necessarily true. But in the instances where it is true, just know that that gives you some bandwidth. So you have time to be building and systematizing as you are growing up. So sometimes it's getting more people in to do the work. Sometimes it's slowing the work down. That's a, a very specific decision based on the, the size of company and the rate of growth that that person's trying to achieve over the time that they define. So clearly you're amazing at this. And what are some other uh, tips that you have that you're also really good at that can help people kind of better run their business there? Well, so one thing I always tell lawyers is that you should always be looking to hire the person that is going to make you the most money. And that usually means a person with a higher price point on them. You're not going to get the highest value out of the cheapest talent. And I know that we as lawyers, we tend to be very risk averse. We tend to be very conservative in terms of how we approach money. But the reality is, if you want to start to create wealth, if you want to start to build what's available, you're not going to save your way to being wealthy. That, that's a, a myth that we have kind of engineered from, from years past, you know, generations past. It just does not work in today's functional world. So you have to start making investments. Those investments will typically start with people. And when you start investing in people, you can get someone who costs more to you in the short run in their salary benefits, et cetera, but they will generate more for you also in the short run. And as they generate more, you have both more time for you to work less so that you can optimize that person's performance so that you can run your business so that you can do a better job on the work that you have. And at the same time, you have that next person who once you get them in and you see that they're a cultural fit, they can start contributing to advancing and cultivating the labor that you will add. So instead of Every time I add a person, they take a little off my plate, but they add a bunch of management responsibilities. You instead want to adopt a strategy of taking a person who will take a lot of things off of your plate and add very little management responsibilities and also add more profit in the short run. Now, I love the way you say of investing in people. I think especially in this day and age, it's such a key thing to really invest into the right people when you're bringing them on board. And especially now when we're in the great resignation, as a lot of people are calling it there. Uh, it's kind of hard to get a lot of people to come in and you want to make sure you're getting those right people. And is that something that you might see a lot of people kind of struggling with is investing into the right people? Yeah. Well, I think the first challenge is the, is the mindset that, you know, because there is a great resignation, I have even more challenge getting with people. Right. So one of the things that we teach that is kind of embedded in everything that we do is the mindset that you need to be successful in any strategy that you approach. And it always starts with being clear that if there's a desire for something that you have, it's available to you right now. You might not see the way to get to it. You might have to get to it in a way that's different based on today's economy or based on today's resignation rate or based on a whole host of other factors, but there is a way. And if you don't believe that, then every time you adopt a strategy, you're gonna go at it the way that you always knew. You're going to start pushing and pushing and pushing to achieve a result. And then when you don't get the result that you desire, you're going to say, see, look, it's the economy. See, look, there's not enough people in the marketplace, which is only going to reinforce that that's what's going to continue to come to you. Instead, we tell people, do a rinse and repeat on your mindset, right? Let's figure out what is working and let's figure out what's not working. Leave the things that are not working. So it's not working for you to complain all the time. It's not working for you to congregate with other people that are complaining all the time. It's not working for you to go about hiring with the same passive attitude of sticking out an ad, hoping someone good applies, waiting for them to apply. You have to be more aggressively in pursuit of what you are seeking. But when you do that and the right person sees the right message in the right time for them and for you, they will come. But you have to have a level of confidence that this person is going to be someone that can add value. And you have to be prepared to add more value to that person, right? Expectations change over time salary points change over time. You have to meet those demands, but not because you are giving into pressure, but because you are fairly compensating. The law of compensation would be that there's value comparable to what the person is earning. So you have to figure out how much value are they going to add? How can I optimize their role to add more value so that I can pay them more so that we're both happy with this? No, I think that's fantastic. I truly love that because putting yourself in the right mindset can change so much of looking into the future and so much of what's coming down the road. And that actually is kind of leading me to what's something that excites you about the future now if you're keeping it in the good mindset there? Yeah, so there are a lot of great things that are coming up in the future. I mean, one of the things that 
uh, I like to tell people to think about is all of the opportunity that comes when other people around you are in a state of retraction. So while I never say that you should exploit other people's tragedies, the reality is that there's a tragic mindset that is kind of circulating in the law right now. Again, the great, you know, the great resignation and the fact that the economy is doing what the economy is doing and the war in Ukraine, right? There's always something that we can point to that says that our lives are going in a negative direction, not a positive direction. But for entrepreneurs, this is the best time to be alive. There is no greater time alive based on the rate of growth that companies can achieve, the amount of information that's available, the resources that are available, the explosion in the coaching industry that people are now asking and actively seeking help. When you look at all of those resources, you have a golden opportunity as other people are saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. You take over where they are losing market share, right? So you then become the resource that people turn to. And once you get yourself a strong enough footing, it's easier to sustain that than it is to be in a constant state of going back and forth between, yes, I can grow, no, I can't. Yes, I can build, no, I can't. You have to just stay the course. And I know it's hard to keep that confidence, but if you start looking around at all of the things that are available that weren't even available five years ago, it's clear that the world is expanding. You just have to lean into that. Now, this is such a great conversation to have on a Friday too, because you're bringing such positive energy into this and I absolutely love it. And now, so you've had so many great points here. Now, I want you to tell me a little bit about yourself. You know, who are you? Yeah, so um, you introduced me earlier. Um, I am a uh, recovering family law attorney. (laughs) I say that jokingly. I actually, I very much still love the law, Uh, but I own uh, the Williams Law Group. I family law attorney my entire career. uh, And probably two or three years into my career, I started a focus on child abuse and neglect parental representation. So helping families involved in the child welfare system. There is a unfortunate stigma associated with that practice area, but I will tell you that the vast majority, well over 80% of people that are accused uh, are found not culpable. And the expansion of definition of what is or is not child abuse and neglect greatly uh, exceeds what the average person thinks of with child abuse, right? So leaving your kid in the backseat of a car to go into the grocery store, or having an argument with your spouse that your child overhears, or punishing your child for not doing their homework and they're not happy and they go to school and say the wrong thing. So kind of fighting that cause, if you will, really put a fire in me for the value of law and the value of good advocacy, but then uh, built up a statewide reputation, started speaking at national and international conferences. I wanted more from my career and I wasn't finding that at the firm where I was, even though they were good people, they treated me well, I was well compensated but I wanted more. So I started my own business and very quickly realized that running a business is not like running a legal career. (laughs) It takes a lot more of skills that I did not have. And I had to acquire those skills relatively quickly. But before I did, I started working harder because that's all I knew how to do. Uh, So worked harder and harder and harder. Uh, One day fell asleep driving and almost died uh, when I almost hit a guardrail. Uh, and that was kind of my aha moment that working harder is not working. So, uh, started seeking help, got myself some help with a series of business coaches over a extended period of time. Uh, and I was able to take my $0 walking in day one at my law firm and turn it into a multi-million dollar business in three and a half years. And by that time I had systematized my business very well, because that was something I always had a knack for building systems. And unfortunately, I had nothing to do. <laughs> so I had really great talented attorneys and I had, I had engineered everything down to a science and we were always systematizing, but I didn't really enjoy that anymore. I wanted to be connected to people. I wanted to help people. Uh, and so ultimately I just started hanging out on social media, started to see that people, uh, lawyers in particular were assembling and asking questions and seeking guidance. Uh, I started offering that available to the marketplace and then decided I would incorporate a business and then launched Law Firm Mentor in January of 2018, kind of figured out what I wanted to do with it for the first year and then hit our first six figures in six months. And we've just been off and running since then. So now Law Firm Mentor is also a multiple seven figure company and I run both of them and I run both of them contemporaneously because everything is highly systematized. You know, you get the right talent. You give them the right systems. They create the systems that they know are needed in order for your vision to come to light and you stay on top of it. And here we are. And I think that's fantastic. And so many people kind of have a tendency to overwork themselves, kind of like what you were talking about there. They feel like they have to put in all these crazy amount of hours, but it's not about 
putting in all those hours and all of a sudden, like you said, you're asleep at the wheel. You want to make sure that you're taking care of yourself in every way you can. I think that's a, it's a problem that is kind of coming to light more often now, especially uh, in this time now with a lot of people working from home mm. and working you know, out of their living rooms and their pajamas. They're finding out that they kind of like that now. Mm. <laughs> and it's kind of a big changer. And I think it's, it's great that you're bringing a light to that as well. I think more people need to hear that it's okay to take some time for yourself and really focus on what's going on there, not overworking yourself and dedicating, saying, hey, I'm going to spend all my time working. And then I get home and I don't want to do anything else. Yeah. So it's interesting. You mentioned the work from home uh, evolution or revolution, as you will. Um, you know, we have we have now maintained a virtual slash uh, brick and mortar office. We give people the option of coming in. Uh, half of the office probably circles through at least once a week. But most of our team is not here. And we have worked very hard to maintain and sustain a virtual culture. Uh, but people are happier this way. And one of the things that I think has made them happier is the fact that just as with our business structure, we very much talk to our attorneys and our paralegals and professional staff about systematizing your life. And I mean that to a sense of, you know, you yes, if you're going to work from home, that's great. But I very much told my team when we first went home, I was like, don't sit around in your pajamas on your ass all day. Like you need to act as if you are at work because you are. And that doesn't mean that you have to get up and rush somewhere the way that you would have had to get up and rush your kids to school before you started working, but you need to have a designated time for work. You need to have a designated time to stop work. You need to have a designated time for how much you are going to accomplish during that work. And you need to be thinking about the things that are going to sustain you as you are parenting, as you are being a spouse, as you are being a partner, as you are being a friend, as you are being an employee, all the things that fit within your life need to fit within your life. And I think a lot of times we get into the habit of saying there's lawyering and then whatever's left over, I give to everything else. And that's just not a healthy way to function. Oh, no. I mean, it can it creates kind of a, a uh, what is it? The tug of war. That's what I'm thinking of there. You know, a little bit of it's pulling in one direction, pulling in the other. Yeah. And a lot and of it, too, even at home, you know, if people have pets. They feel like they have to be go. Oh, I have to go take care of the pet and then I have to be at work. But I got I don't know where to really prioritize that a lot of that data. Yeah. And they don't think about it. Like, I think what happens is, you know, when you have, when, when you have work, there's kind of a start time and an end time for when you're expected to be at an office. Right. And then with school, with, you know, with kids school, there's a start time that they need to be there and a start and an end time that you need to pick them up. And if there's a gap between when you pick them up and drop them off somewhere and when you're home, there needs to be childcare. So those things are pretty well segmented, but I don't think that a lot of us recognize the necessity of being highly efficient in the time that we're working so you don't have to be working all the time, especially in the legal field because it is so stressful, right? People come to us to hand their problems to us. So they had one major problem. We have 40 or 50 major problems because we have their one and then we have however many more clients. So we have all of those problems. And if you don't work on your mindset so that you don't absorb the problems, but you analytically handle them in a process through very streamlined um, systems in a business. And you turn it off at a certain point and go live life and enjoy the things that are a part of your life and have to deal with some oftentimes very stressful components of life, like issues with kids and issues with family and, and issues with home. Then what ends up happening is all of the stress bleeds because there's only so much capacity to handle stress at a time and you're not turning it off. So it's just kind of going wherever it goes. And then people just find great dissatisfaction. That's oftentimes where lawyers leave the law altogether because they just, they want a break and they don't recognize that that is completely within their control while they are lawyering. They only make it available to them when they quit the profession altogether. It's a high rate of burnout then too, because they're just uh, burning the candles at both ends. Yeah. And now we talked a lot about work and how stressful that can be. But what are some things outside of work that you like to do for fun? You know, things that completely forget about law there that you just like to let loose with. Yeah. So um, what's interesting is that anyone that follows my marketing knows that I have two birds that live in my office. Uh, I have two parrots. Uh, one is an Amazon and one is a cockatoo, uh, Maxi and Versace. 
uh, and they are the love of my life. <laughs> they, they are with me all the time. They keep me happy. Uh, so I spend a lot of time with them, but in all seriousness, I love to travel. Uh, it was, that was probably the worst part of, of the initial part of COVID for me. I know we're still in COVID, but uh, the, the restriction on travel was really tough, but I love seeing the world. So I'm traveling all the time. Um, I love doing speaking, public speaking. So even though that is work related, I don't feel like that's work at all. That's one of the things that actually gives me a little bit of a high uh, in, my, in my daily experience. And then, you know, I have some very good friends. I'm involved in a relationship. All of those things take up my, my heart space. So they get a lot of my time as well. Now, what's your favorite place you've ever traveled to? Because now they're, it feels like they're starting to lift some restrictions. So it looks like travel can be back on the menu there. Yeah, well, God, picking a favorite place is kind of tough. Um, I loved Rome. I was in Rome in the summer of 2019. Uh, and I actually, ironically, it was because of a conference where I was speaking, but I only spoke on one day. So the rest of the time I was seeing the beautiful uh, countryside and all of the sites there. But, you know, so that was like a once in a lifetime experience. I am an island girl. Like I love going to the islands. One of my very favorite, uh, one of my very close friends got married in the Dominican Republic back in 2015. And she kind of introduced me to island life. And then since then, I've been to St. Thomas, St. Kitts. I've been to uh, Aruba, um, you know, Barbados. Uh, we're just like always looking for like the next island vacation. And there's just so many out there that are so beautiful that I just love going to the islands. I haven't been able to travel too much. And I'm trying to get some more information because I'm actually trying to figure out where uh, I'm actually engaged. I'll be getting married in September, October. Oh, I should know that one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, That's wonderful. Yeah. We're trying to plan a little bit of a honeymoon there. So I'm trying to see, I'm kind of a nervous flyer. Mm. So I just keep telling him like, Hey, you know what? Just knock me out. And then I'll, <laughs> I'll be fine on the flight. It doesn't just matter. Get the first class seat. So you get the yeah. alcohol included. Yep. <laughs> Just, just any way that I could wake up and go, oh, it's over. All right. Well, that was fun then. <laughs> yeah. Well, wearing, tiring yourself out is a strategy that people will use so that you fall asleep pretty much before you even take off and then yep. you're in the air. And <laughs> my, my family used to get so mad. I would get, I would get physically sick going on flights and mm -hmm. my sisters would be so bad. They'd say, oh, he's doing it again. He's just <laughs> the whole flight now. <laughs> Yeah, but, I get it. I get it. You know, but one thing that does help that help with that is is flying more frequently. <laughs> I know I need to get back on that now. I'm actually going down to uh, Florida in April, uh, uh, end of the month here. Yeah, to see some family. So ah, good. ironically, I'll be in Florida at the end of the month. too. I'll be in Delray Beach for a mastermind conference. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah, I'm going to see my uh, got a three year old nephew that I'm going to be hanging out with. So ah, very excited that about that. Is, so you're going to combine travel with kids. OK, yep. so two, two of the funnest <laughs> things to experience in life. Oh, that he is like, I love that kid so much. <laughs> I love it. He's obsessed with FaceTiming. So I check in with him all the time there. So it'll be good to catch up with him, see how he's doing. Yeah. But this has been such a great conversation. And where can people get a hold of you if they want to get to know you more or talk with you? Yeah, so this has been a great conversation, Tom. You've just been such a great host. And if anyone wants to learn uh, more about how to grow a law firm and how to grow it profitably without it having to take up more of your time, we here at Law Firm Mentor help lawyers to achieve more money and more free time through marketing, sales, people, systems, and finance consulting. So uh, with that, uh, you can check out more on lawfirmmentor.net. And if you just want to get a sense of how we share information, what our strategies are, you can always follow us. We have a podcast, The Crushing Chaos with Law Firm Mentor podcast. We're on all the major platforms. And of course, if you want to get it off the website, it's lawfirmentor.net forward slash podcast. Yeah, and I'll make sure to put all that in the show notes too, so people can find you there. And again, thank you so much for being on here. And thank you to the listeners as well. And if you've learned something, which I know you did, because I got two pages of notes here front and back. So I know you learned something because I definitely did uh, share this episode. It's been such a great conversation. Again, thank you so much, Allison. Thank you, Tom. Have a great day. You as well. And that's been another great episode of Solo De Facto. And I will catch you guys next time. Thank you for joining us for today's show. For more information, visit our site at solodefacto.com. And remember, smash that like and subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. Solo De Facto is sponsored by Back Office Betty's, trusted virtual legal receptionist, helping you grow your firm one call, one chat, 
one new client at a time. To discover how they can help you grow your firm, head on over to backofficebetties.com and mention the Solo De Facto Show for an exclusive listener offer.